the truth about one oak stock. Uh, okay, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but probably how you pronounce it. These guys, uh, first thing you're gonna notice about them is they're about a $10 billion company. Uh, and they're basically in the energy sector. They're in the natural gas sector. Uh, and if you just look at their quick description here, they basically process natural gas and then pipe, like they use pipelines to send natural gas around. Um, you can go over to their site and you can see this picture of a natural gas facility that makes it look like they do natural gas stuff. Um, so that's kind of what their industry is. It's, it's not like some energy companies that have natural gas, that have coal, and then have other sectors that are a little bit more diversified. This is a little bit more of a play directly on natural gas, which is great because it allows you to sort of understand at a deeper level what makes a stock move. It's also a little bit riskier if you're going to hold it long term because it's based, you know, this company is based a lot more on one commodity. And just to kind of show you that, we'll pull up the chart on natural gas and we'll compare it to One Oak. And we can see that historically, uh, you know, whenever natural gas goes up, One Oak goes up. And then whenever natural gas goes down, which is this blue chart right here, this blue one is natural gas. Uh, whenever natural gas goes down, one oak, which is this orange line, uh, tends to go down as well. And so right now what we're seeing is, except for this one exception right here where natural gas went up and the stock went down, um, basically natural gas is going down and now that there's been kind of a recession and all that stuff, you now have one oak just completely crashing. Uh, and we can zoom this chart out to see if this trend validates in the long term and you're gonna see a really, really similar story. Uh, I mean, obviously, like, One Oak is a company that actually has underlying value, and so, like, even when you have energy stocks or companies that are based off of commodities, the underlying commodity in a vast majority, almost every single situation ever, it usually goes up and down and up and down and up and down, and in the long term, no one really invests in commodities because they're usually flat or somewhat negative in the long term, um, but you can invest in the companies that sort of you know, sell those commodities or process those commodities or do things to those commodities is the companies themselves, even though they are going to be relying on the commodity, they create actual overarching shareholder value. And so there's an actual amount of value here, which is in the energy company itself on top of the underlying commodity. And so that's why it's, it's really, really nice when you want to sort of trade a commodity, you think that the move is going to happen in a commodity. If instead of trading the underlying commodity, unless you're trading it in the extremely short term with leverage, you trade some kind of company that's based in that underlying commodity and is going to move alongside of it. So for example, if we look really quickly at oil versus a company called OXY, which is one of the, the really premier uh, oil just manu uh, shipping the companies that, that deal with oil, we can see here the exact same story. You have oil here in blue, and then we add uh, OXY, and all of a sudden you can see that the stock is very, very highly correlated to the underlying commodity, even though it kind of does outperform it in some instances. Um, in the long term, it, obviously, it's, it's really gonna outperform it just because the company adds more value to the industry than just the commodity itself um, until it crashes to hell. <laughs> But yeah, so you're gonna see like these stocks, um, especially these energy stocks, are, are a solid way to trade the underlying commodity. But you do it in a way that creates more value in the actual company, and you also do it in a way that allows you to leverage it with options a lot easier than trying to trade futures on uh, the actual commodities, which is really really nice. Uh, and you're gonna see these be a lot more liquid. Uh, well, they're both about the same. They're about the same liquidity. Uh, but that's sort of the the thing that I want you to know going into this is that this stock is highly correlated to the price of natural gas because that's all they they do. That's all they do is natural gas, and so that's going to be really important when we look at their financials because you know if natural gas goes down, then the price of what they're selling goes down, and they therefore, at least publicly, people think that they're going to be worth less. Uh, and we'll see whether or not that's true when we look at the books. Uh, if we go over to the key statistics, we're going to see some pretty nice financials here. Um, the first thing we'll see is the book value of this company, which is really important for energy companies because they are kind of like, uh, you know, like the thing with energy companies is like they make money and then like if you look at how much money they make over time, it's usually fairly flat uh, because like people are going to pay for their power. Yeah, yeah, like, like they need to have power, right? So, like their top line is usually pretty steady, and then the most important thing that they are managing usually is just the bottom, and how much of that turns into like actual earnings, and then how much of that usually gets redistributed in terms of dividends to shareholders. You're gonna see a lot of these energy stocks that just have like really, really high dividends, uh, just because it's a really stable sector. It's 
also one that's kind of just one to expand. And so instead of expanding, they just return their profits to shareholders and dividends. And that's kind of what you'll see a lot in the energy sector. Uh, right now with One Oak being this, you know, at the price it's at, uh, you're looking at a dividend, which I don't know if this is a, a sustainable dividend, uh, but you're looking at a dividend about 12, 12%, uh, which is really, really, really nice. If you look at their history of dividends, you can see kind of in 08 is what I'm most interested in. If you look at what their dividend did in 2008, you'll see that they were basically paying about 35 cents, 35 cents before the crash, and then 38 cents before the crash, about 35, 40 cents, 38 cents, 38 cents, and then the crash happened and they were paying 40 cents, they were still paying 40 cents, they were still paying 40 cents, they were still paying 42, 44, uh, 42, 44, 44, 46. So what's really great about this is even though the stock took a temporary dip and it crashed a little bit, they were still paying the same, if not greater, dividend. So they were still paying out tons of money here. And that's really, really good for an energy company because it shows that they have consistent cash flow even in times of economic stress. Uh, like what's happening right now, where you have sort of this really big pullback in this inbound recession. Like even though that's all happening, people still need to have electricity. Like they're not gonna be turning out their lights because of the coronavirus. They're still gonna wanna see things. Um, and so that's a really, really great thing to see with one of them. That's something you can usually see pretty consistently in energy stocks. Uh, here's a similar company, Duke Energy. You know, they're doing pretty similar energy stuff. And they were paying about 20 cent dividends pre-2008 and 22 cent dividends. And then all throughout the crash, they kind of maintained that dividend and even increased it to 24 cents. So like, it's really nice to see that the companies in the sector, this is why people turn to energy in times of crises. Uh, it's just because they do kind of have some really consistent top line and bottom line revenue coming in. So with that said, look at the financials. The book value right now is, I think, $15, which is really nice for, for an energy company. I mean, that's, that's a solid book value. Really, uh, that's pretty nice. Um, their short percent of load is pretty low. It's about 3.5%, not too high, not like super low, but it, it's still pretty low, um, which is, is interesting. I would like expect it to be higher for a stock that just went from like 90 bucks, 80 bucks to, you know, 25. Um, so since it's so low, it can show that no one really thinks it's gonna go down anymore. It's, a, it's definitely an interesting, interesting one to see that low. Uh, if we look at their margins, which is kind of one of the more important things for an energy company, we're gonna see about a 6% return on asset, or uh, sorry, 12%, 12.5% profit margin, and about an 18% operating margin, which is really, really good. Uh, you know, you pay a bunch of bill 100 bucks, these guys are getting about 20 bucks, which is, is really good. Um, that's, that's awesome, especially considering like how much work goes into, you know, having an energy system uh, and the fact that their their profits are regulated by the states. I mean, that, that's a really solid, solid, solid margin there. I think it shows in their market cap that they've been growing pretty consistently. Like two years ago, they were a $22 billion company and uh, you know now they're almost 30. So they gained about 10 billion in just a couple of years, which is really, really impressive. Um, a lot of it's held by insiders and institutions just because it is a pretty big energy stock. Uh, and you're gonna see that a lot with energy stocks. These guys love to, um, buy up energy stocks, especially in times of crises. The thing that's a little bit discerning is right now their payout ratio is about 115%. Uh, and to understand what that means, first of all, it means that like they're taking in $100 in net earnings and then they're paying out 115% of that in their dividend, which is why I'm a little bit suspect of the 12% dividend. Uh, but what's cool is if we go over here and we look at their, first of all, their income statement looks awesome. They got like 10 billion a year in top line and they make tons of money. Everything here is awesome, it's all positive. They make a bajillion dollars. This is really impressive. Uh, for a company that's you know got a market cap of 10 billion, to see an income of 10 billion in top line is, is really, really impressive. And, and that's a really, really nice, nice, that's, I mean, they're trading at like a one-to-one -one, you know, revenue multiple, which is pretty low. These guys are bringing in you know, 24 billion a year in top line. And, uh, and their market cap is still 56 billion. So like, I would expect these guys to be trading at about twice the price they're at right now in respect, with respect to their earnings, uh, just because you know, trading at a one-to-one -one revenue to, to market cap is, uh, is not traditional for, for these energy stocks. So that's one thing that I think uh, looks really nice for, for One Oak right now. Now, like you said, they're paying at 115% dividend pay ratio. So the first thing I wanna see is how much cash do they have on hand. 
And it looks like they used to have like 250 million on hand, but now they only have about 20 million on hand, which like isn't the best, um, especially for an energy company. So what they're gonna have to do probably is sell some inventory or, or, or something um, to, to kind of subsidize this increased dividend of 115%, or they're gonna have to decrease the dividend from 12% down to like seven or 8%, which is by no means a bad dividend. Um, but it, but it, you know something's gonna have to happen here. They can't pay 115% out forever or else they'll go bankrupt. Um, so that's probably one thing that could be a little bit of a negative. But I do like, you know, they got a lot of property, they got a lot of plants. In the past two years, they've increased their gross property by uh, seven, billion dollars, which is really impressive. That means like new energy plants, which means more income, which means uh, a growing company, which is awesome. Uh, it's really, really nice to see that. I mean, all around, these guys look like they're doing a really nice job of turning revenue into earnings, and that's the equivalent of making a money. And they do it really, really, really well by the looks of it. Obviously, just because of the nature of their business, they got about 13 billion in long-term debt. That's gonna be their biggest liability. Um, just because you know when you're operating 22 billion in plants, it makes sense to finance everything, and that's exactly what they've done. Uh, just because that is a pretty sizable number for a company that's only worth you know 10 billion dollars, one thing I would want to see is the WAC. Yeah. So if we look at this right here, we can see that their weighted average cost of capital, so the average like percent that they pay on their debt, is about six percent, seven percent. Um, and their average return on capital invested is about 9%. So is it an energy company? They're gonna have, I guess, debt that they have to take in. And I mean, as long as they can take the debt in at 6% or 7%, it's about 7%. As long as they take it in like 7% and then have a net return at like 9%, then you know, you've got a pretty nice little span here where you know, even though they're in tough economic time right now, they're still returning it at a pretty solid return on capital invested. So you got some nice, zones here where this is basically just money, which is really, really nice. They do a solid job. Even though 7% sounds expensive and it is a bit expensive, uh, they, they multiply it well and they have about 2% on that. And as long as that's positive, as long as that's green instead of red, then, uh, then I'm kind of okay with that. I think that's fine. Um, if we look at the cash flow, we're going to see how they service this debt, which is going to be pretty important on a year to year basis, just based off of their dividend. I want to see how much money goes to their dividend and how much money goes to their debt. And besides that, there's not much else I think that, that makes a difference. So they got about a billion a year in net income, which is awesome. Uh, they tripled it from like two years ago, which is really, really impressive. Uh, stock base, I mean, everything here is kind of normal, you know, inventories, small numbers here, small numbers here. Um, about two billion in working capital, which is actually kind of a lot. I'm guessing that's because they have to like change a bunch of stuff or do some construction. I don't know, maybe they did like a new pipeline. Um, that is a lot of working capital. But I mean, this looks like a reasonably run and managed company, so I'm sure they're doing something responsible with that, hopefully. Uh, if we look down here, though, to debt repayment, they're paying about a billion dollars a year in debt repayment. So they take in about 1.3 billion, and a solid chunk of that, like 80% of that almost, goes to the debt repayment. And then you got another 1.5 billion going to dividends paid. So that's about 2.5 billion to debt and to dividends, and they have a net income at least in terms of cash flow, about 1.3 billion. So they're obviously gonna need to increase something here uh, to make it work. I think they should be able to do it considering that their earnings, you know, their revenue's been at about 12 or 15. So if they could just get their earnings up to like 2.5 billion, that would kind of put them in a nice speed spot where they're paying off their debt, they're paying out a really high dividend, and they're just operating over and over and over again in the energy sector. That would sort of be the ideal state for these guys. I don't know why the revenues dropped a little bit last year. I'm sh maybe it's because they were reinvesting in new things, they bought some plants or something, had to shut stuff down. Um, as long as like this year though, in 2020, they kind of come back up, or the revenues come back up to like 12 billion at least, um, and the revenues continue to grow over time, we should be A-OK. -okay. Like, I know there's gonna be a general economic slowdown, but that shouldn't really impact the revenue of an energy company that much. Um, I do know, however, there's a lot of tension and a lot of difficulty just because of the way that the natural gas industry works in the States. Like, you've got a lot of these, like, upper, you know, northern uh, countries in America. Let me like, kind of draw my hand handle, and, and there you go. Uh, so you had a lot of uh, states here, not countries, states here, um, where, where you've got a lot of fracking going on. I'm guessing that's where a lot of their natural gas comes from, is fracking in these upper states. And fracking isn't like the most 
effective way to get energy ever. Uh, there's a lot of like scientific mumbo jumbo behind it, but basically like it's kind of a little bit ineffective in some regard. And so kind of one thing I guess you could be looking at here is like, is this going to be a sustainable and a reliable way for them to actually get energy? Um, and to me, like, I, I just from what I've heard about fracking, I don't think it is. If you're looking like, you know, 10 years out or 20 years out, um, it, it's not a particularly reliable way to get energy, um, but it does work, right? And as long as they can sell it for more than it costs them to make it, then they're kind of okay. And it doesn't really matter what I think about fracking or not. Like if they take it in and they turn it into money, then at the end of the day, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but when I'm thinking about long-term sustainability, Fracking is one of those things where it kind of works, but like in the long term, it kind of doesn't really work. And there's a little bit more nuance to it than that. But in general, it's not necessarily like kind of a place where you want to put a bunch of uh, your money because basically what happens is they build these, um, they build these font, they build these um, these fracking centers, right? They're like little little power heads. They put them like right in the middle of these, you know places in the middle of the uh, the the mountains. Uh, in the and what happens is for about the first like one or one to four years, give or take, they make like a lot of money in like four years. So for the first four years, they do really, really well and essentially um, they kind of like break even after like four years in terms of like the initial investment cost, the initial capital you put into it. They do really, really well. The thing is after a certain amount of time, it's about four years. These uh, fracking centers, they basically, um, long story short, kind of like stop being effective. And so if you think about it in terms of like the 100, there's a high record, it's probably the 100 natural gas in it. It's not 100 natural gas, it gives you, I don't know what you're going to measure that in like square miles, I don't know. Uh, you got 100 natural gas. Like in the first four years, they'll probably take up like this in the total. There's 90 of those 100 natural gas, and then there's like 10% left, and 10% left is like the only part that's left after you actually break even. And so, you know, this isn't always true in every single situation ever, but it, it, it's pretty often the case where you'll have sort of a time period where they make a lot of money in the beginning, but a lot of money they make in the beginning is really just capital that gets reinvested because they had to pay that money back to build the plant in their terms of their debt. And it's profitable in the extent that they can turn 7% debt into 9% return, which is nice. But it's not like, you know, you roll hand over fist money. And so that's one thing about these guys that, that make their business a little bit shiny. The fracking business in the whole in the United States is kind of a difficult one to make work because these factories are even and they have nothing else left to mine. And then they have to go, you know, make the entire thing over somewhere else. They start here, then they have to go over here, then they have to go over here, then they have to go over here. And they put over and over and over again. It's a lot of work for not so much of a reward. Um, and I mean, if they can make it work, then that's phenomenal, right? If they proved over the long term that this model, this model works for them, then you know, by all means, they're a great, great, great company. These guys, I think they went public in 1980. So I mean, since they've been around so for such a long time, uh, they obviously are able to do this successfully, which is great. Uh, that's that's really really nice. But it's just one of those risk factors that I would take into account. Um, because natural gas, just like any other fossil fuel, is kind of one of those things where it gets harder and harder and harder to mine over time. Uh, but if they can do it, then, you know, by all means. Um, and so with that said, I, I like, you know, they've, they've got money, they make money, and it just comes down to them optimizing their revenue to turn it into more free cash flow. Uh, and I mean, as long as they can do that, they should be kind of A-OK. -okay. Even though their stock has tanked super, super hardcore, they still have a pretty nice shareholders equity. Uh, it, it's at about $6 billion, uh, which is really good to see considering that like two years ago, it was at 188 million. So they've really kind of expanded their shareholders equity. And they've done it in spite of, you know, their stock having this massive, massive, massive crash. So that's really effective. That shows really nice corporate governance, a lot of really nice finance plays for whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and so like all in all, this is a really well run, really well managed company. And they look like they're trying to get everything they can out of all they got, which is really cool and super, super cool. Uh, just effective, super effective. If we look um, here at their annual report, we can see that they operate in a bunch of different places across the states, some in Kansas, some in Texas, some in the Bay, and a lot, a lot of different places. 
Um, and these are different places, I guess, where they're fracking, these are different places where they're setting oil pipelines, these are different places where they're building um, you know, power plants. And so, you know, they say bases, basins, assets, market relations. That's basically what their company is um, when they sell, you know, energy. Uh, they say it was an exceptional year for growth. And I would definitely agree that in 2018, it was an exceptional year for growth because the stock went from, uh, I don't know, 58 to 72. But I'm going to be excited to see what the annual report says this year when it, when it comes out because it has not been an exceptional year for growth. Uh, the financial performance is pretty nice. They make you know billions of dollars in top line. I mean, their operating income is great. Their earnings are billions of dollars. I mean, they make billions of dollars. I mean, what else can you say about it? Their market cap is billions of dollars. The market cap used to be 27 billion. It is now 10. Um, so it kind of shows you how heavily the stock has kind of tanked off very lately. Um, if we look at how they've kind of performed according to their peer group. It used to be that they were doing really, really well, but then the stock went down by 75 or 70 or 60% or so. So these numbers are kind of outdated. Um, and again, here is sort of where they are mining. So like I said, most of it's in the mountains up here and then a bunch of it's right around here. So they kind of have a nice little control over this market right here. There's not a lot of people in this market right here servicing these individuals. So it's gonna be nice for them because they're basically gonna be one of the only power plants for a lot of people. And so people are basically gonna be forced to, to give them money to have power in their house. Um, so that's really, really nice. The pipelines look like they extend pretty far. They can sell those to other companies, lease them out. So they have a lot of really, really nice assets and a really good grip over this area right here in terms of um, natural gas. So, I mean, they're a nice, big, big, big player. Uh, you know, I, I could pretend that I know what all these midstream words or fractionator words mean about, like, in terms of the natural gas industry, but I don't. Um, they basically, you know, look, they, they, they freaking, they sell natural gas, they sell energy. It's not, like, that difficult. Um, here they, they talk about sort of how they're processing more through their plants how they're sort of growing. This is a really nice annual report. I, I, I'm very impressed with it. Uh, talk about how they make billions of dollars. Oh, here's some of the projects they're working on, um, which is good. This is probably where a lot of their cash is going. We looked at it, I think the balance sheet said like $2 billion in capital invested. And here we kind of see about $2 billion, give or take, in capital invested in a new growth project. Um, they could have picked a better time right before, like after the recession, to invest in growth projects. But you know, they're investing in growth projects. They're growing their company. They're building new infrastructure. They're building new pipelines. They're building new, I don't know, like I guess buildings and stuff. Um, they're expanding pipelines. So you can see that they're they're doing a great job investing themselves and, and reinvesting profits in an effective manner in terms of just like what an energy company does. And that's pretty nice. That's kind of what you want to see is, is that they're just continuing to grow and they're never settling. Um, I think that these guys started a long, long, long time ago. It was almost next to nothing. And now they're, you know, billions and billions of dollars. It's a very impressive company. It's had a lot of really nice overarching long-term growth, uh, which is super cool, even though they have had a lot of volatility just because they're pretty, you know, correlated to, to overarching natural gas markets. It's kind of a cool little thing right there, though. That's a pretty dope machine. Um, here's a 10K. We're going to see basically these guys, uh, kind of the same statistics that we saw earlier. They talk about some of their, their like actual specific uh, projects that they work on, some of the specific plants that they have, which is really useful. Talk about some of their property. Regulation here is going to be important. Okay, This is actually super, 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 super important. So the FREC, uh, they maintain the natural gas processing plant, and they say that it's not for sale, they're not for transportation in natural gas, uh, and therefore it is not subject to jurisdiction under the Natural Gas Act. So this means that a lot of their plants are not going to be subject to federal price overlays and federal price uh, mandates. This is going to be really, really nice for their profits because it's going to allow them to be exempt from this jurisdiction. Um, for those of you who don't know, FERC uh, uh, is very simply the Federal Energy Regulation Commission. And these are the guys, the Federal uh, Energy Regulation Commission, these are the ones who kind of make energy companies charge a certain amount for their services. And so it's really good that they're not subject to complete and total regulation by the FREC, uh, because it means they're going to be able to set their prices and actually you know, increase their prices. So like last year, they increased their top line, or they increased their price by 11%. Um, and so they made way more money because they were you know, the only person that sold natural gas to their clients. And so that's going to be really, really good that they do have control over their prices. Um, and one way that they could kind of fulfill this gap between income and, and dividends and debt repayments uh, is very simply just by increasing their prices, which is, 
you know, they, they've got full liberty to do that, which is really good because sometimes you have companies, especially in the energy sector, that literally couldn't increase their prices if they wanted to because of government regulation. Uh, like, I remember talking with this guy at Duke Energy, he's one of the execs, he works kind of deep into the investment capital space for energy and uh, corporate energy. And he was telling me about how, like, you know, if he could, if they could have control their own prices, which they can't control their own prices, but if they could control their own prices and they were looking at like a year of energy and this was like, you know, this was the winter and then this was the summer and then this was the winter, basically what he would say is, um, you know, if they could control their own prices, what they would do is they would just pump up the cost of electricity during the winter when it was, when people really needed heating or when people really needed uh, heating, they would pump up the cost a bunch and then when it was during, when it was the summer, people really needed air conditioning, they would just pump up the cost of it a bunch during the summer because people really need air conditioning. And so if you kind of combine those two curves, you get this curve, this line in the middle where it's basically just like straight prices that are super, 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 super high and they make way more money. People have to pay them money or else they won't have air conditioning or heating versus what they currently charge, which is like almost next to nothing because of federal mandates and regulations on energy prices, right? So this is like, you know, give or take, whoops. Uh, we'll call this like 10 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, which is what most people are kind of paying, give or take average. And this is like, you know, $2 per kilowatt hour. And that's basically what their services are worth to people, um, but they can't charge that because they will be like crushed by the government if they do, and they're going to the prices. So even though they would love to charge like 20 times what they currently charge, they aren't physically able to, even though people would like to pay that because they need air conditioning, right? Or they need heating. Um, or else it would be a very uncomfortable, uncomfortable time. And so that's kind of a really nice thing about 1O here. They aren't mandated to, to, can, to follow those federal regulations and to follow those price limits, which is really, really, really great. Uh, again, they transport and they store natural gas. They also exchange natural gas, which is really good. They have sort of an income stream where they can use the pipelines when they aren't necessarily using them for the power plants. So they definitely get a lot out of the pipelines, even if they're not using them 100% for their own use. Um, they can use it for other companies to help them too, which is really cool. Um, just a lot of stuff here that's really nice. This is a nice, you know, overarching company. They, they make a lot of money. Here are some of the plants and how the plants make money. Um, they're mining, you know, ethanol, stuff like that. And they have a lot of land for a lot of mining operations, which is really nice. And they, you know, they care about safety, which is great. They care about you know, minimizing risk and volatility, which um, is not something that's easy to do when you're an energy company um, because, you know, you're pretty highly correlated to the underlying commodity. Um, here we see that basically they say, look, if, if you know, the global economy crashes, um, then we're probably going to crash too, and that's pretty much exactly what's happening here, especially with natural gas. Um, they also say that if they get regulated more, they're going to get screwed, and that's totally true. So it's, it's good that they, that they don't, and they haven't for, you know, decades and decades decades and decades it's, it's really nice to see that and the other thing like the probably the, the, the biggest other thing here on this report is, is just them like talking about the risks uh, and they say look you know what we're an energy company and energy companies like we're pretty solid you know we could get attacked by terrorists but I mean besides that we're a pretty like reasonable company just based off of the market and we're gonna do kind of whatever the market does and try your best to do the best in serving people energy and that's kind of the big takeaway here they're just giving it their all with you know, what they're passionate about, and that's gonna just lead them into a really nice independent company that's gonna kind of weather through a lot of hardships on their Here we see them, like their stock comparison chart, uh, and they've kind of been doing pretty well up until everybody tanking because of, you know, the, the crash and stuff, and so uh, these numbers are kind of older, so it's not that big of a deal. Uh, and, and, but they are doing some cool stuff. I guess they completed a merger, which is super, super cool. Uh, and just all in all, they're constantly expanding. And that's something that's really good. And even though this is a really big company that's paying out a whole quick profit in, in terms of its dividend, um, it's still constantly trying to innovate and do new things and expand. And that shows a lot of balls in terms of the leadership team. Because there's a lot of energy companies that would just sit back and do nothing and rake in profits and never try to innovate once they get super big. And that doesn't look like it's the case of One Oak. And that's really great because it means they're going to have a lot of long-term growth prospects that you might not see with a traditional energy company that's just trying to keep making the same amount of money. Versus One Oak is trying to go out there and they're actively trying to bring in more money to therefore increase shareholder value, increase dividends, increase um, you know, net worth, and in the long term increase just their value as an energy company and their reliability as a player in the marketplace. 
uh, which is pretty cool. I mean, when you open up your annual report with a map that shows you over like half of America, um, you, you know that you have a pretty valuable and important company on your hands, which is really cool and, and super important for these guys to want to. And it looks like even though they don't have a lot of cash on hand, um, they do have about a billion dollars in accounts receivable. So that is probably where they're getting most of their money, which is really, really, really nice. Um, and that's why I guess that's like bills that they send out to clients and stuff like that. Um, and so I, I didn't know they had that much in accounts receivable. So that's probably where a lot of their money kind of comes from. And I'm sure that's like from, I guess, clients, but also just from like people that they serve on a corporate level with their pipelines and, and stuff like that. So, or maybe it's just from the market of them selling their gas and it has to come through, um, sort of, you know, they sell it and then it comes over to them after a certain amount of time in terms of money. Um, and so that could, I guess, take a bunch of, a little bit of time. It could be one of the reasons why they don't have as much cash on hand, but then they have a lot of accounts receivable. Um, that's just a small little nuance in their accounting. It's not something that they have a deal. As long as they have enough cash to like not go bankrupt, you're gonna be looking at a pretty solid company. And considering that they have 18 billion in property and plants, they're not gonna be struggling anytime soon. Like the worst thing that could happen is they sell like a $1 billion plant and then they use that money to, to keep maintaining their company. And hopefully that won't happen because they should have pretty solid, reliable income just from the fact that they're selling people electricity, which is a pretty tough market to, to mess up when you're established in it. Um, here's a lot of their debt. Uh, most of it's at like four or five percent. Uh, except apparently like they've got a lot of it here at eight percent, a lot of it here at seven and a half percent. Um, so even though they have a lot of really nice like two percent debt, um, the weighted average is still about seven point eight percent, which is kind of what we saw earlier. What's cool is now that rates are at zero, they should be able to refinance a lot of the debt, and so hopefully now that rates are super low, they'll be able to get sort of a, a lower whack, and that'll thereby increase their profits because they can still reinvest it at a nine percent return, but maybe they can lower their average cost from seven percent to like five percent. I think that's a pretty reasonable thing that they could do considering that we're in like a zero interest rate kind of time. Um, that, I think that's that's pretty close, and that should be something that they should be working on kind of right now, um, considering that it just happened. Like, they should be really, really on top of that, because they can lower their debt service by like 10%, which is hundreds of millions of dollars, if they just kind of refinance that debt at 1% or 2% lower rate. It's really, 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 really nice. I'm spending a little more time on this annual report just because it's an energy company, and energy companies are based a little bit more on fundamentals than on any other kind of sector. So it's pretty important to, to understand what's going on with the energy companies in terms of their annual reports, uh, and, and really at a core level where their money comes from. Because the bulk of these companies is based off of them making money as an energy company. And so you do want to be a little bit more careful with these more like conservative stocks um, when, when in these conservative industries when um, you have pullbacks because you want to make sure that the underlying company is not going to go bankrupt. Like you know, I don't want to be messing around with the company and not know what they're doing. And then all of a sudden it's PG&E and they burn down like half of California and then they go from like 70 bucks to eight bucks and then three dollars. I mean, that's a really, really bad loss. Um, it's a really nice bull, uh, bear flag. I mean, that's a dope bear flag. It's a really, really nice trade. But um, you know, you wanna kind of know what you're investing in because you don't want this to happen to your investment ever, which is why obviously it's had a stop loss. But similarly, like, you, you know, you, you kind of wanna know what's going on beforehand. Uh, when you get into trading the technicals, because this right here was a, a bear flag I traded, and um, I remember like getting into it, I was super careful about it because I wanted to make sure that this company was actually terrible before I shorted them, and then they were actually terrible, and then the, the position like doubled, which is 50% net, um, doubled, triple. I think it's 12x on the off, which is pretty nice. Uh, and so that's kind of why I spend a little bit more time with the fundamentals of these guys, because it does matter. So with that said, everything checks out. It looks really nice. It looks like a solid company. They make a lot of money. It's really cool. The question is, is this a really nice time to buy now? And uh, in the long term, is it going to be a nice one to buy? I think in the long term, these guys are solid play, nice dividend. You know, as long as they keep it above like 5%, you're looking at some pretty nice dividends here. Um, really though, the play is, is usually not in the dividends, it's in the capital gains, and that's where I think this one shines. So if we kind of draw this line looking at where it's been historically from like 2008 um, to, to, and also it kind of crashed a little bit in 2016, we kind of see this connection here where this is the bottom, this is the bottom, this is the bottom, this is the bottom, and it, you know, it, it's kind of right here on this line. Now I'm not going to say this line is going to be perfect because in 2008 it went below this line, uh, it went to 10 bucks instead of you know 12 bucks, so it went down to about another 20 percent or so, um, 30 percent, and nine. It went down to about another 30 percent. Um, so you know I'm not gonna say it's perfect, 
but uh, this is a pretty damn good setup. Um, I don't think this will bottom until the overall market bottom, and we're still going to have a lot of volatility until late like April, which I think is pretty reasonable. Um, but I mean, right now it's almost the end of March, and I mean, these guys look really, really, really nice. You've got a lot of volume here, really big, big, big red volume bars, which is like phenomenal. It shows the bottom of the price movement, and that's just a really nice indicator of them kind of bottoming out. Uh, if you look at it in just in terms of like the monthly stochastics, monthly MACD, you're not going to see too much. But if you add the percent B, that's where they start to get kind of really, really nice with this stock because you're looking basically at you know the last time they bottomed out on the Bollinger percent B was in 2000 and uh, 2008. Uh, so the last time they really, really went negative on this was in 2008, and so. Basically, that's kind of where they're at right now. Is they're at a bottom in this percent B, um, and when they bottom, it still took them about two or three months to actually physically bottom. So that's what I'm thinking is going to happen here. If they, like they bottomed on the percent B, and it'll likely take them a little bit of time to actually physically bottom. But just based off of the fact that this entire movement happened in one month instead of over the course of like four months, um, you're looking at a really, really, really nice play. Here. Uh, the question is how fast is it going to move up? And in all reality, um, you know, I think it depends a lot on the market in general, um, just because you know they're an energy company, right? And energy companies aren't going to lead the market; they're usually going to follow the market, uh, just based off of you know historic trends with these companies. So I'm thinking you got kind of two routes that this could take. And the first route. Uh, I love, and it's my favorite ever. I don't think it's gonna happen. And the second route is the one that's a little bit more conservative and likely what's gonna actually happen with this company. So the first route is bullshit crazy, but could kind of be nice if it actually worked out, is basically you've got the stock right here, and it kind of like instantly bounces up, it totally fails here, it never crosses over here, and it never comes down on either of these, and it just kind of goes like straight up in like one month, and it does a green, or a, or a red, green candlestick reversal, and it goes up super quick, almost instantly. And that's basically probably not gonna happen, but there is a tiny, tiny, tiny chance it does happen. It's probably not gonna happen though, okay? And the reason why it's probably not gonna happen is because if you think about it in general, like these guys are very heavily correlated to natural gas, and natural gas doesn't move that fast just historically in, the, in like one month. It just doesn't usually do that. Here you can see a lot of the really big dips, and it usually takes you know a month, two months, or three months for it to really rebound. Uh, even in 08, I mean, when stuff was moving super quick, they bottomed kind of in August, and it still kind of took them until November to really recover. So you're looking at about a three-month turnaround in the underlying price of natural gas. And if you kind of overlay oak on top of that, you've got a really similar story being told by the the company. Like even though they'll bottom really quickly. Because um, usually stocks go down faster than they go up, it still is going to take you know one or two, three months for it to really kind of reverse here and, and to find this bottom. And so that's kind of what I think is happening here. Is it's not particularly likely that they just instantly go back up. I think we're going to have a little bit of consolidation here, and that's kind of where we get into what will probably happen with this company. Is the first thing that we're going to need to see is, is um, and I'll, I'll get back to these technical indicators in just a second. So just ignore those for a minute and just look at the chart here, and just look at the, the price. Basically what you want to see happen is really basic. You want to kind of see this stock consolidate around this, this line that we just drew, which was the, uh, the line that was based off of the two previous lows in 2008 and in 2016. And you want to see it consolidate at this line. You want to see it consolidate below the 200 moving average on the, on the monthly, and just kind of chill out for a little bit until I would say like June-ish. Um, and as long as it can kind of chill out until kind of June-ish, then I think you're going to have kind of this overarching, maybe like, you know, four month reversal where it goes back to maybe like 60 bucks or so, 64 bucks. And that's really what the play looks like with, um, with this stock. And to kind of validate that play, what I want to do is I want to go to the chart and add like the weekly MACD, the weekly stochastic, because that's where I think you start to see a lot of this trend really solidify in a really nice, 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 nice pattern. Yes, here you can see it's going down, it's going down, it's trying to blow the weekly 200, uh, but really, you know, you've got probably, I'd say two or three weeks of it just consolidating down here until you really start to see this stochastic bottom out, you really start to see the MACD bottom out, and the play here is really going to be 
for them to bottom out on the stochastics and bottom out on the MACD for about a week or two or three weeks, and then have a crossover, and then start to recover it and really, 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 really grow. Um, conservative target on this for like the next, you know, give or take half year is uh, like once they recover, it's probably like 50 bucks or so. Um, I mean, they can get there pretty easily. They've proven historically that they can bounce just like that. And that's kind of what I think the strategy is. They're going to consolidate a little bit, maybe around the $25 mark. And then, you know, these, these guys should basically double. Um, so if you look at it in terms of a straight equity play, the stop loss on this trade should be at like probably 20 or so. Looking at risking about 20% um, to make about 100% in terms of uh, the equity, which I think is pretty reasonable. You can tighten it to a 10% stop loss if you want. Um, it'd be a little bit aggressive, but honestly, if you just give this thing like two or three or four weeks, um, it should sort of consolidate bottom out. I really want to buy this thing like the moment that it breaks over 30, as long as the consolidation looks good. Um, and so if they do break over 30, let's take a look at the options and figure out what that means for um, the profits we can see here. We'll call these um, I'm going to call them, like I would trade the Octobers or the, the Julys, but in terms of time frame, this is about a four month trade. Um, so I'm going to look at the Julys in terms of like pricing, but I want you to understand that when you actually make this trade, you want to add about, I would say, four or five months to the time frame whenever you enter the trade after it consolidates and after it breaks above give or take 30 and after the VWAP and the, or not the VWAP, the MACD and the stochastics cross over on the weekly and the percent fee kind of crosses over too. So with that said, once that does happen, um, if you're looking about a four or five month trade here, which is why I'm going to look here at the July calls to kind of get a sense on what the pricing will be. Um, right now the volatility in the market is super high, so I'm guessing that once this thing does chill out, the volatility will lower by a factor of about 20 or 30%. So these calls should be about 20 or 30% cheaper when the trade actually makes sense to take. So I want you to understand that these numbers are going to be a little bit conservative because these calls are likely pricing in a lot of time value that you won't have to price in when you enter the trade because like unless you want to enter it right now, what I recommend doing is just waiting a little bit, let the stock chill out for a little bit, let the time value chill out for a little bit, let the volume and the volatility chill out for a little bit, and then get in when it's basically a guaranteed setup so that you have less time invested in the trade, you have less capital invested in the trade, you have more upside, and you can set a tighter stop loss because you know that it's less volatile and therefore you can have a tighter stop loss. Um, so we'll call it a $50 target. Um, I think that's pretty kind of ish. Like, I mean, I, I mean, I think like that's where it'll go. Uh, maybe it'll go to 45, but I mean, I'm gonna call it 50 because this looks like a 50 dollar stock. Um, and so you can get kind of like near the money puts or near the money calls, sorry, uh, at like 25 for like five bucks. So you're basically you're looking at turning five bucks into about 30, which is about a six x return. If you get like 30 dollar calls, which are about five bucks out of the money, you're looking at about a three dollar call. Uh, and those are gonna have probably a net return of 20. So you 20 by three, and you're looking at about a six X return. Um, and then I think you kind of get to the sweet spot here around the 35 and 40 mark. So you can get 35 calls for about a dollar, a dollar 60, I would say. And so those are gonna have an inherent value of 15. So 15 by a dollar 60, it's gonna give you about a 9.4 X return. And that's where the sweet spot is, I think, for this stock right here. Um, the seven, uh, the 37.5, are, I would say a, a dollar and uh, I don't know, maybe a dollar thirty. Uh, you should be able to get filled about a dollar thirty. That's going to give you an inherent value of like twelve and a half, and that's going to give you a very, very similar about nine point six to ten x return on that investment. It should be about ten to eleven to twelve x, just based off of the time value that you'll get from it. Um, but I'm going to go very conservative and just look at inherent value. Um, the 40s are probably the highest I would go because there is a risk that it only goes like 45 or something. And so I would really go much over 40. Um, you look like you can get 40 calls for about a dollar. And assuming it goes to 50, you're looking at about uh, a 10x return on those. Um, so the thing is like you've got a 10x return at $40 and a 10x return at, at uh, $30. Uh, or $35, and you're committing about the same amount of capital, maybe like 50% more capital. Um, so you could spread it out between the two. I would probably put about, uh, probably a, a good majority of it into the lower strike price ones that have the same return, because you're committing more capital, but you're also saving your ass in case the stock doesn't go all the way to your target. So you're still gonna have a multiplication. You'll still probably have like a three or four or five X return, even if it only gets to like half of what your target is. 
And so that's kind of the nice strategy and in a good little way that you can take the closer to the in the money ones that are still out of the money, but the closer to in the money. Um, and you can put, put your money on those instead so you have a little bit more leeway on the trade in case it doesn't go 100% perfect. Because, you know, in all reality, this is a really volatile stock, but, I mean, they could take a little bit longer than four months to rebound all of this loss. So, um, you know, how quick it happens is, is up in the air, but I think it could happen pretty damn quick just based off of this movement right here taking four or five months, this movement right here taking four or five months. Uh, I mean, you're going to look at about 80% of your profits on this trade are going to come basically as soon as it freaking bottoms. And that's, I think, going to be the really cool strategy. So with that said, it does need to rebound. It does need some time to chill out. Give it a month or maybe a month and a half or something. Um, but it definitely, 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 definitely 100% needs to come back up. It can't keep going down. If it keeps going down, the setup is invalid and it's bullshit. Uh, but if in the next month it makes like a really nice hammer candle, like this hammer candle right here, if it makes a hammer candle like that, again, then you're gonna have a really, really, really nice stock, a really nice reversal, and within a couple of months, you're gonna be looking at about a 10 extra turn on the calls on here, or uh, doubling your money. Well, I probably have 60 or 70% gain on equity, uh, which is really, really nice. And uh, that's probably the big, big takeaway here is oh, so I would definitely set a freaking alert for these guys. If they go over 30, I mean, I would be in these calls like no one's fucking business, maybe over 20 a aggressively. So that's the big takeaway here of one up. Just make sure you give it enough time to uh, to consolidate because it does need a good chunk of time to consolidate. Or else it's not valid. Like you can have the setup validate, but if it validates too quickly, sometimes it's like not a good setup in the end. Um, so you do want to make sure that it actually does consolidate. Because if it happens too quickly, what'll happen is basically um, you know you've got your, your stock right, and if this idiot goes down a bunch, and what you want to see is it, it really does need to consolidate because if it just immediately goes back up then what's gonna happen is it'll basically just flop back down in it. But if you give it a little bit of time and it consolidates, and then it goes back up, now it's gonna be valid, and then it's gonna have the actual overarching growth that you want. And, and so that's really the, the play here with one of them. It's, it's a little bit nuanced, and it's gonna be a couple of months until it works out, or a couple of weeks at least. Um, but it's a really, 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 really nice play. Yeah, I don't think that is good. Just make sure you set a stopwatch, it'll be solid. Hey, this is John. I want to thank you so much for making the end of the video and hope you get a ton of value from the stock that we just broke down and hopefully learned a lot about them. Now, what's cool is if you have an investment that you think could look really, really nice, or maybe it's a potential investment that you're on the edge about, or maybe it's a stock that you're holding right now that you're just a little bit curious about, or maybe you want to get an outside perspective on it, what's cool is you can comment down below with the ticker of the stock. I'll actually put it in Queen uh, for a potential new video coming out. Now, make sure you also subscribe so that when those new videos do come out or when these new stocks do come out, um, you'll be able to get YouTube will know to send you the stuff. And if you click the bell, you'll actually directly get a notification so that you don't miss any of the new investments that we break down on this channel. Now, what's also cool is if you want to learn how to outperform 99% of investors and radically limit your downside, even if you can't pass a finance test for your life or have nothing to start with but a few spare bucks, I want you to open up a new tab right now or go to a new browser, wherever you are, um, and I want you to go to stockmarketsecretsexposed.com. And inside Stock Market Secrets Exposed, you get instant access to a course I used to sell for thousands, a very, very high level seminar I gave. Um, the students literally go through and in their first month make five, six years, and I can't guarantee anything, uh, but I know for a fact that this, this stuff works and it, it's, it's gold. What I want to do is I want to give you this course I used to sell tons, tons, tons. I want to give it to you completely for free so you can learn the top 35 secrets that you can use uh, within the next week to really, really crush your portfolio, really double it uh, and radically limit that downside. So if you want instant access to that, what you got to do right now is open up a new browser tab and go to stockmarketsecretsexposed.com and I'll send it to you for free. Okay? Sound cool? Sound fair? Thank you again so much for watching and I will see you either in another video on here or over in the, the master class. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.